Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, event uh, organized by the Global Policy Institute in uh, Bay Atlantic University in Washington, D.C. Uh, my name is Paolo von Schirach. I serve as president of the Global Policy Institute and also as chair of political science and international relations at the Bay Atlantic University of BAU. Again, we are downtown Washington, D.C. Uh, today, uh, we are going to listen to uh, one of uh, Europe's, and I would say probably more than Europe, uh, global uh, experts on all matters pertaining to uh, rising sea levels and how coastal areas, and in particular lagoons, can uh, and should uh, uh, deal with the challenges uh, of, uh, of uh, our changing planet. It is no mystery, and many of you probably are aware of the fact that because of global warming and increased levels of CO2 uh, that traps heat in the atmosphere, we are witnessing the phenomenon of the melting of glaciers, um, and then that means that more water, ice turning into water, adding to volume, and rising sea levels. While this may sound to many like a problem for tomorrow, that you know, somebody else will have to deal with as a distant issue. Unfortunately, it is not the case. It is quite real and happening now. Uh, and uh, many, many communities around the world, whether it's in the United States, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, whatever, are already busy trying to uh, figure out uh, practical solutions uh, to save coastal areas from flooding. And Venice is definitely uh, a very, very important hotspot in this in this respect because of its, uh, you know, uh, origins and a city created on a, on a lagoon and has always been threatened by high waters and high tides and what have you. But now with the added problem of rising sea levels, what used to be a nuisance has had turned into a crisis. And uh, uh, Giovanni Cerconi with us today is uh, was has been and is at really at right at the center of all this of the debates and then of the uh, plans and solutions that have uh, uh, been put together over many years uh, that now give uh, uh, venice a, a brand new uh, sort of set of solutions which are articulated and he will explain what this is all about uh, not just physical barriers but also uh, attempts uh, to, to recreate the natural environment uh, which should uh, help preserve Venice, uh, which is a you know, patrimony of world cultural heritage, if nothing else. And of course, a place where people, real people like you and I live and want to continue to live in, in, in decent conditions without having uh, to uh, you know, have water at their knees or, 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 or above for many times during the year. Anyway. Uh, with all that, I just wanted to say that, that we at GPI and BAU are really, really committed to exploring and finding out and analyzing uh, best practices and, and, and ideas and novel solutions uh, that help all of us, you know, on this earth uh, cope with uh, the impact of global warming and, and hopefully devise uh, uh, methods uh, to have, uh, you know, sustainable development uh, models which are affordable, cost-effective, and good, uh, good for all of us. And with that, I would like to turn it over to my good friend and colleague Massimo Charla, who will uh, be kind enough to moderate this event. He will give a, maybe a more appropriate uh, introduction to our speaker, and then Giovanni Cecconi will tell us uh, uh, Venice's uh, story. Thank you. Massimo, over to you. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Paolo, and uh, uh, welcome and thank you, Giovanni uh, Cecconi, for uh, this uh, event, uh, to participate in this event uh, 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 on Venice, uh, Venice Minnesota the Project and the MOSE Project. So, um, Paolo just presented uh, the, 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 the great problem that we are facing today uh, with this uh, climate changes, uh, and uh, one the, the the Venice project is uh, is a coastal environmental uh, uh, engineering project that they use 
use uh, all the state of the art uh, integrated solution and uh, is uh, observed and studied with the high very interest uh, by several countries uh, that are involved in uh, uh, searching solution for the mitigation and adapt adaptation of the effect of the climate changes. This uh, project that will be presented by, by Giovanni uh, uh, Ciccoli uh, today, uh, ago. and uh, Giovanni was uh, one of the uh, first to be involved with the projects. And uh, um, is, uh, this time, I mean, uh, a project that is not only based on the, 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 the storm surge, I mean, the barriers, but also based biostabilizing structures. And Giovanni, uh, resilience in the lab, uh, that uh, is that. Uh, and it also uh, is also promoting uh, uh, sustainable solutions uh, for a coastal city in uh, different. Part in all the world is in the, in the integrated natural based solution for navigation, for fishing, uh, for agriculture, and uh, um, for also the ecotourism that is going to, to present I mean, today too. And um, we said that, I mean, I uh, would like to. Uh, uh, Ask I mean, uh, Giovanni to start the presentation. That, uh, as I said, it will be not just based on the uh, storm uh, uh, barriers, but uh, it will be uh, more uh, the, the full project uh, uh, that includes I mean, uh, all uh, the different I mean, uh, aspect of uh, uh, restoring the environment and, uh, and uh, 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 reinforcing sandbars and with the coastal protection structures and uh, um, uh, also um, improving the quality of the, the water that has been uh, uh, um, uh, created in a province I mean, by the industrial activities They've been uh, uh, took in place I mean, in the south part I mean, of the, the lagoon. We said that we'll say just uh, Giovanni, uh, 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 let's uh, start the, uh, your uh, presentation and presented this uh, uh, fantastic I mean, uh, projects. Um, uh, all the people that I mean uh, they are uh, uh, the participant I mean, of this uh, uh, um, event that they would like to ask a question, please uh, 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 put your question in the Q and A. A section and uh, we will uh, address uh, this question at the end I mean, of the uh, Giovanni presentation. So Giovanni, please, uh, um, is, uh, you're on. Thank you, Massimo. Thank you for this very kind invitation. It is a great honor and pleasure to me to be with you today to introduce you to the Venice experience in adaptation to sea level rise. Here you can see the title of my presentation and who I am, as Massimo has summarized. Our motto is borrow, blend and serve. And I expect from today a nice borrowing and blending exercise for serving the world. Okay, Venice by itself is the history of co-evolution. Giovanni, uh, we lost uh, your uh, uh, voice. You are on mute. I was trying to remove the video because I cannot see the slide. Allora, nascondi. 
okay, it's better I don't touch. Uh, so it is a, the history of coevolution. Coevolution is the competition and cooperation all together among uh, water and land, the environment uh, and uh, the civil society. And the very secret of Venice rely on the on, on to this. And now we have to face conservation and development. Again, there must be a competition between the conservation and the development. Venice is a very complex system. It's a natural lagoon, it's an industrial arbor, it's an historical city, and it has been able to maintain for 1,600 years. This year, by the way, we are celebrating the birthday of Venice with great celebration. And if COVID will allow, you are invited to come and join our Resilience Lab, who will promote this international exchange of experience. Essentially, it started as a fish farming place. And in the 12th century, it was uh, the logistical base for Europe to reach the Holy Land during the Crusade. That's why Venice is made of many islands with monastery, because the monk took uh, care of the logistics. Also, it is a nice uh, wetland system and uh, with plenty of barrier islands who are protecting the lagoon. But uh, if it was only by nature, the lagoon would have been siltated. The Venetian redirected the river out in order to maintain this unstable environment. Here you can see before human intervention, the shift in the archeological remains from Neolithic, Mesolithic and Bronze Age due to the oscillation above in the main sea level. But then, human entered the lagoon, they arrived because they were searching for food, hunting and cultivation, harvesting clams, fishing, fish farming, and then they had to cope with nature because the natural system was unstable. Here you can see the siltation of one of the three inlets separating the sea from the lagoon, and there is this shoal of sand that was accreting, and the fishermen that uh, strive to get, earn their living at sea with the storm find the death just in front of the house because of the difficulty entering the harbor. You can see, in order to reach the harbor, you have to take this canal, so you have to look at certain post and follow the line, but then at a certain point you have to change the line with other Belfry Tower. Most of the time they ended up during the storm ashore and dead. So with this uh, claim, with this speech, a mathematician in 1875 asked for installing a solution. Leonardo da Vinci studied the possibility to use the natural energy of nature, the tidal energy, to flush the sand away. And this was done, but only 50 years later. This intervention can resemble a very much impacting transformation. If you do an environmental impact assessment, maybe you fail in getting the authorization. But at that time, there was no BIA regulation and the work was done. And if we look now at the consequences of this huge transformation, imagine to reduce the tidal inlet to one third, installing this huge inlet breakwater in order to concentrate the tidal current, make it quicker, faster, in order to scour the sand below. Then, what has happened? Here you can see the site of the construction of the inlet breakwaters in this location. And uh, we had a very long discussion in uh, installing uh, the navigation lock to enter the lagoon when the barrier are closed in this location because they are close to one of the most renowned natural area that is uh, protected by European regulation. 
So the end house uh, of that previous transformation is this magnificent dune park in which there are many species and biodiversity. Now, my question to you is why uh, humans are able to trigger such amazing uh, natural transformation? The answer is based on two constraints, two, two, uh, two positive uh, outcomes. First of all, availability of space. If you, when you interact with nature, you have to give nature the space to grow. In the air, there are plenty of space. In fact, this pocket trapped the littoral drift and the, the uh, wave energy and wind energy piled up the sand and then the sun started to grow the ammophila that is a special plant that is stabilizing the sand in the dune system. So the space is a constraint that in this case was uh, well respected. And then you need time. You cannot, uh, if you allow nature to take its own time, its own peace and uh, build up, uh, these species are very smart, are selected during their evolutionary history to uh, engineer the landscape in order to make it more viable for their living in terms of food, in terms of stability. So essentially these species are uh, natural engineers and we can cooperate with them. So another important aspect I want to stress is the landscape you see at the very wide scale start at the microscopic interactions among the sand millimeter size and among uh, cyanobacteria and other organisms that provide stability to the sand, as it is the case in this footprint. Again, this is a shelter, and in this shelter you have a protection in which you can trap the nutrients and the seeds, and then in the following year, you have the best melting pot to have the amorphil, to have the uh, allophytic vegetation that lives into the brackish water to start growing. We published this understanding of how nature is working. Uh, in uh, a publication here, you can see in uh, International Journal of Design and Nature Ecodynamics, uh, together with Professor Tiezzi. And we called this behavior cause, confined, ontic. Ontic is the capability to preserve itself without awareness. Open, you must be open to the flow of energy and matter systems. And these systems are able to pump order out of chaos. So they are providing a, a well-structured and a fruitful uh, environment. But Venice is also a place in which uh, we have the mass tourism. And before COVID, uh, we had a very serious problem coping with this uh, flood of people entering the city with the huge ships. This is because uh, human forgot uh, about uh, the equilibrium with nature. So now we want uh, to exploit nature in a very short time to be in Venice in just one day, half a day, in half an hour to commute from the airport to San Marco and then go into our magnificent cruise ship and continue to travel in the Mediterranean. This is not a co-evolution or co-evolution co 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 between the society and the nature because as you well remember, in order to be fruitful, this cooperation needs space and time. Instead, here everything is concentrated, and so it, that's why it is a negative impact. Whatever you do, the impact remains because we want to travel faster. And this is the problem. 
why not to transform the time of travel into an opportunity? This is how nature is working. For nature, there is no dead time. Nature is continuously active to maintain uh, its uh, uh, possibility to survive. And so we have to behave. Sea level rise is another challenge. Here you can see Trieste and Venice. Trieste is in a rocky area, so it's very stable, not affected by subsidence. The, that is the squeezing of the soil due to tectonic motion and to uh, compaction. Instead, uh, Venice is a weak soil, Trieste and hard soil. And so you can see that Venice, in Venice, the sea level is rising twice as fast as in Trieste. And uh, at the moment, we had, during the last uh, 20 years, a jump in the order. I try to point out, let's see if it works. Uh, the pointer, let's see, no, I'm not sure. But we had the jump, you can see maybe my cursor, of uh, uh, 15 centimeters from, from 23 to 35. All over Italy, the problem of sea level rise is very big. And the area in red will disappear with the sea level rise of one meter. So this means uh, all the areas from Ravenna till uh, Grado. The flooding is more and more frequent and more and more the city is flooded with an higher water. Here you can see the duration of the flooding from the beginning of the century. So it has been amplified by a factor of 20 and also the surface that is impacted. The Venice solution is a combination of engineering nature and learning and building with nature essentially and mobile structure coupled with the local protection so we are rising the bank of the city as much as we can in order to maintain the city open do you remember the openness of the cause if we close too much the city is not working so we need to keep the city open but at the same time we need to keep it protected, so confined in a way. And the confinement is provided by the flood barrier. So again, the flood barrier and the local protection is the proper balance between openness and closure. Mm -hmm. And this is associated with the huge reuse of sediment, sandy sediment at sea to protect the beaches and muddy sediment inside the lagoon to construct uh, Mm, salt marshes. This is the general scheme of intervention, so a combination of a mobile barrier, coastal protection, local protection, the safeguard of the polluted dump side of the past, and the, the local protection of historical island. Till now, 56 kilometers has been protected of littoral, with more than 8 million cubic meters of sand, 12 kilometers of dune, artificial dune with the rain planting of Amopila has been reinstalled, and also the inlet breakwaters has been armored for a total span of 11 kilometers. Just to give you an example, we are speaking about a project in the order of 12 billion euro. Katrina, require 36 billion euro, most of them to build dikes and levees. But of course, the size of the Delta of the Mississippi is 10 times the size of Venice. So, and the subsidence of the New Orleans is much higher than the subsidence of Venice. At a certain point, we have to think about if adaptation and resilience is the solution or if we have to retreat it will depend on us if we are unable to stop sea level rise with a better sequestration of co2 and change the composition of the atmosphere in our fresh in our uh, advantage in our favor then maybe we can continue to strive on the coastline otherwise we have to consider to retreat for now, because we 
do not have any more subsidence because we stopped the extraction of the water in Venice in 1970, we can uh, afford the, the solution that is uh, to install an artificial beach that is protected by groins and uh, submerged breakwaters in front of the seawall in order to reduce uh, the impact of the wave. But uh, if uh, sea level is going to rise, or let's say half a meter, this beach will rapidly disappear because of the reflection of the wave of the energy against the seawall. Because this flexible solution is an added on on top of rigid structure and cannot survive if you, even though it's well designed, if you change the environmental conditions. This is just to explain the limits of adaptation in case sea level rise is gonna rise with, at a speed that was not uh, experimented before. Other solution refers to the reconstruction of salt marshes, uh, reusing the dredged uh, material for the maintenance of the harbor and the navigation channels. I want to come back to here because the similar solution uh, is in place in Galveston, Texas. And now in Galveston, my colleagues are considering to install a big, uh, in the Ike Canal, a big storm surge barrier as it is done uh, here in, in Venice. And we uh, shared experience with them and it was very interesting because uh, for us it was a way to go back 30 years when we were in the very beginning considering uh, envisioning this future of a protected uh, lagoon. And, and now looking at them uh, doing the first steps, uh, trying to rise the consensus with uh, public participation indeed for us is a, a way to rejuvenate ourselves so please come again and visit us and we are more than eager to share with you our experience because this is very much uh, uh, triggering our enthusiasm in what we are doing here in a peer review fashion so salt marshes i said also 39 kilometers of armoring of salt marshes, similar to what you do in the, in the Mississippi River with uh, the Delta with the Christmas tree branches or oyster reef, this kind of activities that are important, not only because we help nature to help ourselves, but because we develop a community. The people can do that kind of job by their bare hands with small boats, and in this way to stay connected. Another important attribute of adaptation is interconnectivity. And interconnectivity is fundamental for resilience because if something happens, there will be a citizen that will ring the bell and everybody will come and sharing the solution and sharing the experience, the problem will be solved. Instead, if you have a centralized system of supervision and control, at a certain point, the unexpected comes and the system will fail because there will be nobody on alert on, at that moment. So it is very important, uh, the circulation of knowledge and the awareness, and this can be done only if you are able to pay for connectivity. But how to pay for connectivity? This is the purpose of May Lab to create a connectivity machine that keeps the people connected in any way possible, in any possible way. These are the evolution of the salt marshes, the different scheme. I rushed here because this will be another lesson when we do next time just to show you the environment and how nature like this uh, neo formation environment. Immediately, if you do uh, send uh, the position in the middle of the lagoon at the intertidal level, oyster catcher comes nesting. We have more 300 terns nesting each year, just uh, 300 meters from the historical city you see in this picture below. 
And this is the oyster catcher. There are at least uh, 20 couples and they regularly come over the last 10 years. And this, the age of this uh, system is only 10 years old. You can see how it was done. Just uh, an armoring with uh, gabions. Uh, gabions were deployed by this inner canal. Here you have to see that the canal was dredged internally in order to make stronger the edge that is facing the bottom boat, the waves and the way from the wind. And then we fill this area with the sand from the foundation, the excavation of the foundation of the barriers. Similar activities. Uh, we developed a spatial gabion made by, by geosynthetic and the small stones or uh, or Oyster. This is which you can see the historical pond for keeping the juvenile that are sold, that will be sold to the fishing farmers. This uh, activity dates uh, since the 1500. So what we did was to restore the edge of this uh, salt marsh, guesting the fish farm, the fish pond with uh, new land in front. This is uh, instead uh, reclamation of the industrial area that were polluting the lagoon because of the lack of a confining wall. Here you can see an example of a bauxite deposit with polluted with mercury that was stabilized with this sheet piling. Local protection. These are very important because if we want to protect Venice with mobile barrier, we have to close almost every day. So this is not viable because of the impact of navigation and because of the cost of the operation. So at that point it would be much more convenient to close Venice inside the ring and allow the tide to enter in, in and out the lagoon. But before reaching that time, that maybe will come in one century, we, we are able to stop sea level rise due to global warming or just in 40 years, if we do nothing, we have to live with this kind of solution. That is local protection. 100 kilometers of embankment has been elevated by 10, 20, 30 centimeters. Also San Marco Square now has been delayed because of architectural reason and authorization. And now in the beginning, we thought to this kind of solution to avoid the seepage of the water from the drains from the ground or, for, or overtopping of the bank, just to, to modify the elevation of the square rising at this area and installing a bentonite gel membrane all over the square, kind of an inverted pool but the interaction with the marble was so big that the superintendent of the fine art decided not to go ahead with the, this solution. So the, uh, the present solution is to intercept all the conduits that are discharging the drain, rainwater to the lagoon, but also importing the salt water inside the basilica in front of the basilica. In this area that is now flooded more than 200 year, times a year. Of course, uh, we need uh, to modify the slope uh, of the pedestrian walkway to reach uh, an elevation that is uh, 10, 20 centimeters higher. There are special spots like here in this corner of the Duke Palace in which we have to install some uh, steel or uh, glass plat. And uh, apart from this, what we will do will be to maintain the conduit and put some uh, inflatable balloon into this uh, restored conduit in order to automatically stop the external water from entering inside. The work was scheduled to start the 1st of February, a few days ago, but due to bureaucracy, uh, they have not started yet. This is one of the tasks of the Venice Lab, 
to facilitate the understanding of the bureaucratic problem and the weak point with a better interaction, interdependency between uh, the user and the provider in order to solve the problem as quick as possible. Kyoja is very interesting because it's been protected just uh, uh, on demand. So there was uh, the change of the elevation of the pedestrian walkway, similar to what was done in Swolle in Netherlands, in which uh, this, the historical Roman city built on top of a sea wall has been uh, protected by a modification of the slope and installing uh, uh, barriers just inside the house because some of the house has been cut in two parts with uh, these uh, barriers in order to maintain safer day in, in a part, part of the inhabitants. Instead, in this case, we were lucky because we could uh, install uh, the rise the the pedestrian walkway and install two gates at these two extreme. So in this way, all the area is protected. This is the one of the gate. But uh, this uh, local solution are not infinite. At a certain point, you have a limit because if you continue to rise the pedestrian walkway, you need to rise also the roof of the building. This means to demolish and build on top. As a famous archeologist said, Venice has a tradition of building on top. You have to continue to demolish and build on top. But of course, not everybody agree with this <laughs> of building on top. And Ammerman made a very, very strong criticism on National Geographic. You can read the saying that the barrier is artificial. So we have to demolish and build on top. Of course, yes, very simple, but we are not in India in which uh, whatever is new is nice and uh, is interesting because they are more spiritual than us. We need our article, our, our memories around. We are different. So any culture has its own limitation. In our case, we don't like to build on top. And that's why we try to install the barrier. Let's look at this film if it's working. Uh, so I relax a little bit and then uh, we restart. Non si vede Giovanni? Come non si vede? We can see it. Yet. Giovanni, can you please select the optimize for full screen media option? Okay. No, we cannot see it. It's better we now. See it is uh, the old like gold gray. Can you? We can't see. If, uh, can you? Excuse me. Are you, it is a uh, good quality or not? Because we can't uh, see it right now. We can hear it, but we can't see the video. Can you please select? You cannot see the, the video. No. Can you please check the box? Optimize for full screen video. Like, like I, you did I before. I did it. Optimize per clip video. Yeah, for I did, full I did screen. Mm -hmm. A full okay. screen. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, it's not uh, disability information in a school. Optimize per clip video. Yeah, optimize for full screen video clip. Can you please uh, it's not, check it's that not, box? Uh, it's not available, this button here. Uh, okay. We will go, but essentially, 
I, I will stop this. We have to go back to the to the presentation. Sì, andiamo qua. La presentazione qua. Okay, let's continue with the presentation because I have plenty of figures. So, and I, at the end, I will send you the YouTube or web address to see the video by yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, we do. Okay, yes, so, do. Thank you, thank you. So, the solution is uh, the installation of a mobile barrier at the free inlet separating the lagoon from the sea. Here you can see Lido entrance, Malamocco and Chioggia. In Lido there are two canals, so there will be 21 gates, 20 meter wide, in a depth of 6.5 meter, then 20 gates in San Nicolò, 12 meter depth. Malamocco is the deepest, minus 14 meter, because the, here is the navigation channel that goes to the industrial harbor. And there will be 19 gates. So this means that uh, the width of this inlet is uh, 380 meters. These are two inlets of 420, 400, and Kyoja is a width of only 360 meters. So altogether, it is a, a mile, 1.600 meters. 78 gates for inlets. So this is the inf mobile infrastructure. Of course, when these barriers are closed, we have a full protection of the littoral that has been reinforced with beach nourishment and seawall. And also the river entering the lagoon has been redirected out. So Venice is kind of an atoll with all the doors that are closed, both from the watershed and the rivers and the sea. In, so if you want to install a similar device in Houston, uh, in Galveston or uh, in New York, uh, the main challenge is to provide uh, the wall that is strong enough because uh, as the mayor of Venice said uh, in the very beginning of the project, uh, you cannot install a steel gate on a clay wall, on a fragile wall. And so the first priority is cost of protection. And then to think about mobile barriers. This is the lesson from Venice. And everybody was happy with the cost of protection because every year the property are in danger. The Lock are located in Lido into this row, as I explained. You can see how close the historical city is to the northern inlet. This is Malamocco, in which there is the navigation lock. And this is causing only two hour delay when it will be finished for the ship to enter, even though the barrier are raised, are in position. In the beginning here, it was uh, designed a very fast uh, sliding door to open and closing the door in order to allow the ship to cross the lock very rapidly. But unfortunately, this door is not suitable because here we have a lot of resonating waves producing a, a, a stable oscillation here, also because of the shape of this uh, arbor. So this uh, resonance uh, destroyed the first uh, sliding door that we installed. Now a second project on a rail is under construction and it will be installed. At that point, we have another problem. This historical inlet breakwater that was maintained is causing difficulties for the ship to turn and align themselves to enter safely. And so the, the pilots are asking to demolish this one. These are the kind of constraints that we have here in Venice that are delaying the work, even though the work has been operated during the last two months, three months, almost 20 times, avoiding the recurrent flooding with very great success, as I will explain later. 
But it is incomplete, of course, because of the bureaucracy, because of the constraints, because of our Italian attitude. But uh, uh, it is working, it is effective, as you can see in the CBS broadcasting that uh, I will send you, I will distribute through the chatting line because we cannot see. So you have the witnessing of the functionality, even though imperfect, it is working. Maybe this is the secret of the flood barrier, an incredible solution for an impossible problem. Chioggia. Uh, the system is made of uh, reinforced soil foundation made by concrete. It is uh, precasted and then uh, they are uh, li lowered into imposition from a dry dock that can be done above sea level or just in a in a bay that will be inundated later the most critical uh, mechanical aspect of the barrier is related to the hinge the test to allow the motion of the gate when from rest position to working position and at the same time to allow the air to enter in order to rise the gate and allow also the possibility to, with a twist lock, to disconnect the gate every three, five years for maintenance. This is how the gate is functioning. At rest, we start injecting air in this upper chamber. And when the momentum is in the order, is able to compensate the load of the gate at these 300 tons, the, the gate starts to rise. The pressure of the air reduce and so the volume expand and so there is an acceleration and very rapidly in few seconds the barrier will emerge. Then adding more air, the water can exit from an hole or descend and so the, the, the system can stay in position with the three meter at sea and one meter or less in the, in the lagoon. When the operation are finished, it is enough to allow the air to exit inside the tunnel and automatically the water will enter from this hollow that is continuously open without any mechanical device. So this system has no valve at all all the valve are in the dry place inside the tunnel and it will go down accelerated and that's why there are dampers as you can see there are dampers to stop the falling these are the dampers to stop the acceleration when it falls back the solution was chosen among many, many other kind of gate, as you can see, we did more than 500 million of studies, investigation and experiment during the first 20 years of the project. And uh, this solution, for instance, uh, with the intermediate peers are cheaper, but much more dangerous and not viable for Venice because of landscape limitation. In London, there were two accidents. They decided to have uh, the same gap uh, as the London Tower, that is 60 meter piers, every 60 meter. And uh, they had uh, two accidents. One was very bad because it was a dredger that collided against the pier. Uh, rubber is also inexpensive, but for a so long span without piers, you, it's difficult to reach more than 150 meters, at least 20 years ago when we did these evaluations. Now maybe there are other kind of material that will allow this balloon to be operated in a more robust and uh, resisting, long-lasting solution. This solution also is very interesting, similar to the Rotterdam system. This is a barge that is, uh, in, that is kept in the dry place aside, 
and brought into place just by uh, removing the water and uh, allowing the boat to ship, uh, to, to sail to the location. But in our case, in order to have a dry dock for the barge, we would have uh, destroyed uh, the historical fortress at the two sides of the entrance. Also, the weak point of this is uh, it is good in place without waves. If you install it in place with waves, such as uh, the Malamocco navigation lock experience, you know, it will be put into motion and the load is so big that it, when it will hit the bottom, it will destroy any kind of foundation you can figure out like a big hammer. In fact, this has been applied in Rotterdam and other places in which there are not significant wave or long wave oscillations. This is uh, Netherlands in which uh, the Spanish sporty meter because they have a a motorway on top. So this was beneficial, it was a win-win situation in which the landscape was not important and they, they could exploit the piers also to make a bridge. And now they also installed the uh, turbine to make a tidal energy. They have a very nice, this uh, five, six meter tidal range. This is, uh, Greenwich, London, the Thames Barrier, the oldest. And in this case, uh, the architect made the pier very nice, but they had a two collision, as I told you. And the maintenance is very cheap because they just uh, turn the shield on top and paint it and put down again. The Rotterdam Barrier, the size of two tower Eiffel, the strong point of this solution is monolithic so you have only two pieces no waves no landscape constraints and you use it very rarely only once every 10 years if sea level will increase maybe once every five seven years instead in venice we are using 20 50 times a year so a completely different that's why our solution is modular of small pieces that can be put into position in just uh, five minutes. Instead, this barrier takes uh, at least uh, three hours to be put into position and you have to close the arbor for the full day. When you close the Rotterdam arbor, you don't have navigation lock here, you lose 1% of the GDP of Netherlands. So it's a completely different barrier, even though it can look similar. So uh, one aspect is the size and the shape of the steel structure. The other is uh, the requirements and the operability of the structure according to the environmental condition. So I'm not saying that you have to use the most fat barrier. I'm saying that our solution was very challenging and not so simple if compared to these other barriers. Hey, Giovanni, we should probably leave some time for questions. I mean, uh, how, yes, uh, how, how, much, how many minutes I spoke? Uh, so we have now another five minutes. Uh, to five the... minutes. So I go, oh, no. I, I go to the... to the end. I mean, to the end I mean, of the presentation. Uh, yes, then, the, the, then the, the, how, how much time do we have for the discussion? Five minutes. So, oh, I, five I, minutes. so I, 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 I another minute just to wrap up. And okay. So here you can see the barrier, how they are made, uh, the monolithic casing that were transported over rails and then to the lift and from the lift to the water. This is what is inside the tunnels, the special inch male female coupling the first operation was done for the first four in 2013 i managed the, the rising of the operation on november 2214 just uh, hey, incredible it's uh, seven years ago and now 
uh, here you will see on YouTube uh, the film on the chat. Uh, the operation has been uh, started the 3rd of November with the first testing and uh, it was decided to operate the barrier even though incomplete uh, in a flexible way. The maintenance is very important. We have to decide if you keep it in Venice as a way to uh, trigger the economical development of Venice different for tourism or to bring it uh, far from the city. It's very controversial. But by the time the, 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 the maintenance is suspended, and even though it was scheduled every five years, now it's eight years that the, the barriers are below the water and need to be maintained. This is the control room. And the, the good news is the barrier can be operated in a modular way in order to flush the lagoon to avoid anoxia and for other environmental uh, benefits. The end over of the barrier is expected to start uh, 1st January 2022, so at the end of this year, to the new authority that I expect, if you sign my petition, will be ALMA, Agenzia Lagunare Magistrato alle Acque, to go back to the historical institution, Venice, over the last 1,600 years, 1, years. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni, for this uh, uh, very, very uh, comprehensive in the presentation of this uh, project. That uh, is, is, we see that I mean uh, is not just the barriers, but they include a lot of uh, other in uh, uh, structure that has been uh, constructed in the lagoon and uh, in coastal protection along I mean those. Uh, uh, um, uh, Break, break, breakwaters. Uh, one question that I could have, if I, if I may, if you want to give us an overview of the, the principle and the, and the factors that will affect I mean, the, the full or the partial closing of the gates. Can you repeat? Because I was reading a question on, uh, was distracted. Uh, so I said, uh, just you want to give us an overview of the principle and the factors that will affect the full or the partial closing of the gates? Essentially, we can use completely closing the full lagoon or use the hydraulic impedance. The flooding is modulated by the astronomical tide. So every six hours comes up and then goes down. This means that uh, we can use the time of travel of the water and uh, use the capacity of the lagoon in order to dump this wave. This can be done if we want to reduce the flooding of uh, something like 15, 20 centimeters. We can close only the northern entrance. But if we need more than that, we have to close also the navigation channel that is two inlet out of uh, three. And if the st storm is the first shot with a very unpredictable winds, not seishing, in which it is easy because every 23 hours the Adriatic Sea is resonating and so the superimposition of this seishing with astronomical tide give us the possibility to use 60% of the storm, the, the intermediate storm, the partial closure. And this is under discussion now in the newspaper. If you go into my web page, I am arguing with a professor in Padua that says uh, that the barrier must be operated all together because if not, it will be unsafe and dangerous to the lagoon. Yesterday, I was out in the lagoon to measure the impact of a partial closure because at last, after many, many efforts, I succeeded in forcing the authority to test the partial closure. And they were very successful. No environmental effect and also a good reduction of the Usta as expected, 17 centimeters, more than the 15, that is the minimum. Oh, thank you. 
Um, one question that I have from uh, the participants is, uh, what is the design life of the Venice barrier? The, the technical life of the barrier is one century. This was foreseen for a sea level rise in the order of 50, 60 centimeters. If we are going to have 100 meters of sea level rise in the next century, this means that the technical life will be half, but the barrier will not be an economical failure apart from the value of existence of Venice, because we have 50 years to find another solution, and it is the first advantage. And second, the cost of flooding over this next half life of the technical barrier, the cost of this flooding is two, three times higher than the cost of flooding over a century, the avoided flooding. Because of increasing sea level rise, will uh, increase the number of flooding exponentially. During the presentation, uh, you mentioned uh, that the cost of the whole uh, project was uh, around uh, 11 billion dollars. Uh, among the, uh, those uh, the different uh, structures that were uh, uh, built there, how much was the cost just for the barriers itself? The barrier is 50%, 5.6 billion euro not dollar there is a 20 percent difference now <laughs> in euro in euro right right and the rest i mean another five million billion euro just where all the reinforcing bars and the coastal protections and all the uh, the the the, yes, the, yes. the all the all the structure the other costs are related to um, like in the chesapeake bay pollution control from the watershed it is also very cost expensive because it's the maintenance of the reclamation and the basin in order to avoid uh, non-point pollution then there is the cost of securing the dump illegal dump site of the past then the cost to protect uh, all the small island this is not included in the barrier the local protection and the cost of uh, reinforcing the littoral every year we have to put 10 percent of new sand because uh, every 10 years the loss we have is 10 percent this is a very low figure because our beach nourishment scheme is a protected beach nourishment and so we, our sand lasts much longer than if you make a free nourishment without protection, stone protection. Absolutely. And uh, then we have also the environmental restoration of the wetland, the dredging, the reuse of the mud, and the, the maintenance of the lagoon morphology, hydrodynamics, and capacity of bio treatment because the lagoon and the wetland can absorb the nutrients from the watershed if they exhibit a variety of morphological shapes, a variety of landscape. And this variety of landscape provides, as, you, as I try to demonstrate, a variety of eco ecological services related to the biodiversity that we can introduce into the system. So if the lagoon gets flat and is transformed into a bay, we lose the morphological diversity that is able to support the ecological biodiversity and, and then the ecosystem services. Most of the time, especially in the United States, this ecological value are not considered when you, for instance, in Galveston, I could see the evaluation of the cost effectiveness, cost benefit of the different scheme. There is no computation of the value of the ecosystem services that you produce. And usually this is causing to waste sediments. You dump the sediment at sea because it's cheaper. But you don't consider the value for the ecosystem in bringing the sediment on shore and doing uh, dunes or doing uh, natural based solutions. Another, uh, the, all these costs, I mean, uh, yes, uh, in the, this risk analysis are uh, definitely I mean, uh, being done. And, uh, but uh, one of the questions that we have also from the uh, uh, participant is, uh, uh, what is the, uh, the operation and maintenance cost per year to operate, uh, operate these barriers? 
It is in the order of uh, 50 million for the barrier itself, uh, including all the personal, the painting, and ma maintenance and operation. And then uh, we have another 50 million for maintaining the complementary structure. I explained the beach nourishment, the wetlands, the maintenance of the canal, and the maintenance of the delta in terms of phyto depuration. So altogether, uh, also the dredging of the city, because uh, the sand, the mud goes into the channel of the historical city in which there is not a sewage system. So we have to treat that mud that is polluted. Right. We actually, uh, another question that I mean from uh, the, uh, the the participant is. Uh, when you operate I mean, the barrier more frequently as the sea level I mean, uh, rises, what kind of ecological impact to the Venice Lagoon you foresee? You have to consider that in, in Venice, you have a nip tide and spring tide. When there is nip tide, you have at least six, uh, eight days a month in which uh, the tidal range is reduced to just plus minus 10 centimeters or so nothing for more than eight hours. So these are summer closures because this can happen not only in winter, but also in July, August. So the impact of the closure is negligible. Uh, of course, you can consider that operating the barrier will attract uh, different species in ecological terms. So in terms of water quality, there are only advantages because you can flush the lagoon if there is stagnation due to a closure that by chance happens in July with high temperature. But usually the closure happens in the stormy weather. This means that the water is well oxygenated and redistributed and the lagoon is flushed by the wind that is uh, inducing a residual current in the system. So. Generally speaking, we have uh, two main uh, considerations. One is related to the number of hours of stagnation that are negligible because Venice is experimenting a natural barrier that is the tidal energy that is modulated at the nip tide. Second, we have uh, the effect of the wind and the low temperature that, that is uh, in, uh, that is uh, correlated with, of course, uh, with the storm. And if happens uh, stagnation in summer, in, for instance, inside the city, it is enough. We have demonstrated with uh, a model that was asked by Walter Munch uh, that died uh, last year at the age of 101. He was a very close friend of mine and visited Venice many times. He used to say, let's the moon sweep the lagoon. And now with the barrier, we can do that. Okay. Um, uh, I ask in Denise if we can have a, an additional five minutes for questions that I see they are coming uh, uh, in a very uh, rapid way. Uh, so another yes, question. Yes, sure. Oh, thank you. Um, Giovanni, I would like to, you to uh, spend I mean, a couple uh, words I mean, on the, the operating and control system of the, uh, the MOSE project. That is a very uh, in, in, uh, important, important I mean, a part I mean, of the project itself. Yes, I, I want to stress that our solution is the result of the ice storm meeting we had over the last 10 years. And uh, we uh, made a, a full tree analysis to study what was the main uh, safe way to build the barrier and operate it. And it ended out that human error is very important, but also the variability of environmental conditions are very important. And you cannot foresee all of them. Nobody could foresee the impact of COVID, for instance. So with this in mind, we made the best from the machine and from the human. So the system is fully automated, but is supervised by humans. So the, the machine is proposing the operation and this operation are confirmed by an expert that is there to supervise the operation. Also, the people is there to assist the machine in case of a failure of a valve or a component. 
and the, the machine says, please open that valve because I checked it's closed. And so there are two possibilities. The monitoring system is wrong or the valve has been clogged. In this case, you need the, the human. The machine is not able to solve this. Rotterdam instead took uh, another attitude, not now. This happened uh, 20 years ago. They decided that the human error is so big, the failure after, we were after Chernobyl, after Long Mile Island. So, and so the atomic agency and other agency that uh, consulted the Dutch uh, engineers said, human error is terrible. You have to avoid uh, human interference. So do Rotterdam barrier completely automated. And this was done completely automated. You do nothing. You, the machine goes by itself most of the time. And then what happened? The, at a certain point, the situation, the environmental condition, the modification in the component, the electronic equipment, so the aging of the system was so quick that instead of having a reliability on demand of 1 over 10,000, the reliability was 1 over 10. Huh. Because the local expertise disappeared. Nobody were able to keep, take peace with the equipment because they shifted from an internal governance to bidding and then they lost a lot of knowledge. And so the new upcoming company that won the competition for the maintenance uh, refused to operate the barrier based on the manual and asked more money to test again the barrier as if it was uh, it went from moon not trusting uh, the paper indeed so this is a big lesson that stress the importance of keeping the local knowledge in place independently from the economical reasons because uh, if you lose that, uh, you can go into very, very big trouble. That's why I invite you that are listening to me to sign my petition to reinstall in Venice the historical authority instead of bringing one new that will uh, forgot all the knowledge that was accumulated over the last uh, 30 years. Uh, Giovanni, uh, 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 well, one last question, uh, if I uh, if I may ask you, is uh, uh, of course a project like this, I mean, uh, involve I mean uh, the citizen uh, in their day their daily life and so on. And, uh, um, so, how the Venice I mean uh, Resilience Lab helps I mean uh, in uh, uh, keeping uh, informed, uh, involve uh, the citizens I mean uh, of Venice. Uh, in uh, uh, this with this Mose project? Uh, essentially, what we do is exploration. Ma we do magnificent exploration of how nature is working in the Laguna with the young student, with pensioner, and we monitor the impact of the closure. For instance, yesterday I measured the velocity and the propagation of uh, the differential closure all over the Laguna. They, we have installed the rod and they can take a picture of the rod, send the rod to me, immediately I prepare the report. And if you go to my Facebook, you can see the impact of the operation that was made by the citizen. So this is called citizen science, not just for the sake of curiosity, but for, to help people to practice adaptive co-management. So if we learn together, we can have a, we are able to speak up and ask what we need and get it because we are also able to do concept proposal. In this way, we can uh, trigger the money from the top to come down and fulfill the need of the people. At the same time, the people can bring a consensus in a democratic way to the governor and then we can interconnect not only the citizen among themselves connected to the pleasure of living in a beautiful city and a beautiful lagoon. And this is a socio-ecological interconnectivity. 
but also a social connectivity when we deal with the, the policy and uh, the governance. Well, thank you very much, Giovanni. With this, I mean, uh, uh, last, I mean, a uh, uh, consideration that a uh, uh, very, very, very important on the involvement of the citizen should be in a project like this. I would like to thank you, the, the Bay Atlantic I mean, uh, University and the uh, Global Policy Institute, Paolo von Chirac, and uh, um, thank you very much, Giovanni. And uh, uh, probably in the, in the next, I mean, a few uh, few weeks, uh, we're going to present uh, other uh, uh, situation, other uh, projects around the world uh, that I mean uh, involve the protection of the certain uh, coastal area. Uh, due to the uh, climate change. So thank you very much for all uh, the, the uh, per, uh, participants to this event and uh, uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.